in preparing my message last night, um, I happened to look at my email and I found a letter that was written to me by an individual whose life was changed by the ministry here and by God working through other individuals. And it just shows me how important it is for us to realize that God wants to use you to be a life changer. The power of a saved life. We think of the power of God, but the power of God works through humans. So I'd like to read uh, this particular email that was sent to me. He said that I could share it, so I'm going to share it. He said, Pastor Rob, and I just got this last night. Grace and peace to you. It has been on my heart to share something with you for the past few months. I have passed by New Covenant a few times, and no one's been there during those times, so I write this email to you. I pray that what I have to say will encourage you, and if the Lord wills the congregation and any unbelievers that may visit there. This, in short, is what has taken place just prior to my visit to your church on Friday the 13th, September 1986. That's a long time ago. I was 24 at the time and just had lost my job two weeks prior due to lateness and absence due to lifestyle choices. I had a substance problem for several years and had put myself into great debt. All of these years walking in darkness like living in black and white with the weight of the world around my neck. I felt all alone and tired of life, a failure, and decided I would end it all. I had taken a shotgun out, loaded it, and a few minutes had passed, and a friend that had been telling me about Jesus knocked on my door and said, God sent me here to stop you. She told me that God loved me and has a purpose for me, and then she took me to the Friday night service at New Covenant. I must admit to you that I did not listen to the word you spoke that night. All that time I was thinking about that God loved me and had a purpose for me. I didn't think I had a purpose or even think anyone loved me or could. Honestly, I didn't even know uh, now I didn't even know what real love was. At the end of the service you had an altar call and invited people up, and I was one of the first there all the time speaking with God, saying, if this is real, I need help. I need a reason to go on. You had come down from my right and prayed for a girl who attempted suicide that past week. Then you came right next to me and prayed for an elderly brother and sister. I didn't know what to expect. You turned and walked away from me in the opposite direction. I died inside and said, I guess it is not for me. And as soon as I had finished saying this to myself, you turned and went to place your hand on me. But just before you placed your hand on me, heat shot through me and I went straight down. I was surrounded by a great light. It was no longer of where, uh, didn't know where I was or anyone that was in the service. I was crying for the first time in years. Again, I said, I need a reason to go on. And God spoke to me and said, I am. Every part of me felt alive. Every cell in my body was like jumping. I needed to be healed, delivered. And he said, I am. I never felt love uh, could feel this way. And I can imagine that as a child when you get hurt, your mother comes and wraps her arms around you and comforts you. And you would feel safe and secure. This is far more than even that something that I cannot find the words or the thoughts to describe. I think I was on the floor for about a half an hour or even more before then I realized where I was and others were there around me. Even to this day, I do not know what you prayed or even said. One of the elders in the church had taken me in the back room and tried to find out what had taken place, and he said I needed to be baptized. I was in awe at what had taken place and really was notable. Uh, what was notable, I couldn't talk uh, very well for three days. I didn't sleep. I had read the whole New Testament, and for the first time, I could understand. To think that just before all of this, I was obsessed, oppressed, depressed, and possessed. 
Now I was a new creation in Christ, forgiven and set free. I was alive, born again. I had been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That Jesus bore all my sins in his body on the cross, that I might die to sin and live to righteousness, and by his wounds I was healed. Thank you for your faithfulness. I do, not, I do know it was and is all God, but he chose you to be part of it. I pray this, that this encourages you and others, and I pray that the Lord of glory continues to use you as he sees fit to his glory. Isn't that wonderful? That blesses my heart. I want to talk to you for a few moments about the life-changing power of a saved life. We think of the power of God to save, but God has chosen individuals to witness the gospel for him. And when we witness and share, like this individual, this girl who went to the house because God sent her there right before he was going to take his life, she had a part in it. I had a part in it. The congregation had a part in it. The elder that took him in the back room that told him he needed to be baptized had a part in it. And I want to encourage you today because if you're listening to this message and either you don't know Christ or you're a Christian and you wonder if God could ever use you and what am I going to do for God? God will use you because he didn't save you if you're a Christian for no other reason other than number one, he loves you and that as God freely gave to you, he wants you to freely give to others. There are so many places, not only in the Bible, but in life itself, that we have seen changed lives begin to change thousands of other people's lives. When Jesus saves you from sin, he fills you with his Holy Spirit and you become his witnesses with this life-changing power. I want to look into those lives of some who were transformed and they went and they blessed others with God's power in their lives. And again, the title of the message is the life-changing power of a saved life. How many people are saved? Well, there's life-changing power in you, not only to change your life, but others. Let me ask you to guess who wrote this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Would you put that up? Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor the idolaters or the adulterers, nor male prostitutes or homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You see, all of us might have a past that might not be as bad as some of the individuals that this individual quoted. But I can tell you right now that this individual who quoted this did something that's horrendous. And yet God changed his life and through him had changed not only thousands, but millions down through the centuries. His name is the Apostle Paul. He used to be named Saul and now is the Apostle Paul. And this is what he wrote in Acts chapter 22, verses 4 and 5. He wasn't ashamed of his testimony. And that's why when we give our testimony, never be ashamed of it. Because it talks about how Christ can take us from where we're at with all the bad things that we did. He cleans us up. He washes us as white as snow, as the Bible says. He remembers our sins no more, and he puts his new life within us. And then that new life begins to speak out. So when we share our testimony, it blesses others. This is what Paul said. It's in the Bible. He's testifying and Holy Spirit inspiration. Acts chapter 22, verses 4 and 5. I persecuted the follows, followers of the, this way, which is Christianity, to their death. Paul was a murderer of Christians, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As also the high priest and all the council can testify, I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. If God can take Saul, change his name to, the, to Paul, he becomes one of the greatest, greatest apostles that we have. And yet he always told his testimony. I was so wrong. I lived a sinful life. I was totally wrong. I thought I was doing right. I was doing wrong. 
the life-changing power of a saved life. When we look at other individuals down through the centuries that have had their life dramatically changed, I look for some that, well, I look for one that was not so well-known so that you could see that even individuals who not too many people today would know about them, but they had a dramatic change in their life because of the power of Jesus Christ and the influence of others on them. Here's a guy named George Mueller. He lived in 1805. He died in 1898. His early life as a child was marked. Um, he wasn't marked really by righteousness. On the contrary, he was a thief. He was a liar. He was a gambler. In fact, by the age of 10, he was stealing government money from his father, who was a collector of taxes in Britain. And while his mother was dying, he, at 14 years old, he was playing cards with his friends and he was drinking. You talk about far away from God. He was lost. He was a sinner. And what do sinners do? They sin. Now, his father had hoped to provide him with a religious education that would allow him to make to get a lucrative position as a clergyman in the state church. So he sent him away to study divinity at the University of Hal. He wasn't even a Christian. By the way, there are a lot of people that learn the Bible, but they don't even, they don't even know why. They were just brought up religious, but they have not changed their life. They haven't had a life-changing experience yet. But something was going to happen to George Mueller that was going to change his life. Now, not everybody in divinity school is a heathen and not saved because it just so happened that one of his friends invited him to a Christian prayer meeting. And there he was welcomed and he began to read the Bible and discuss Christianity with them as they attended their meetings, just like we're doing in the discipleship class. We discuss the Bible. We discuss life, life with God, life without God. And then after seeing a man praying to God on his knees, George was convinced of his need of salvation. As soon as he got home, he went to his bed and where he knelt and prayed, and he asked God to help him in his life and to bless him wherever he went and to forgive him of his sins. He immediately stopped drinking, stealing, lying, and began hoping to become a missionary. And he began preaching regularly in nearby churches and continued meeting uh, with the other churches. Well, who is this man? Well, he became a great Christian evangelist, and he was the director of the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England, and he cared for 10,024 orphans in his life. He was well known for providing an education to the children under his care to the point where he was accused of raising the poor above their natural station in life. Now, back in the 1800s in England, if you were born poor, you stayed poor. If you were in the aristocracy and you were wealthy, you were okay. But he took these individuals, educated them, and they started to break out of being poor and breaking into middle class and upper middle class life. He was accused of that. That's a nice accusation to make, changing somebody's life. Wow. He also established 117 schools which offered Christian education to over 120,000 children, many of them being orphans. The life-changing power of a saved life. Now, you listening to this message right now, you're saying, well, you know, wow, that's something. I mean, I haven't even done half these things these people have done. I never murdered anybody, and, you know, I never, you know, stole from my parents, and, you know, I never, you know, never did half these things. But what changed them? somebody's testimony. For George Mueller, it was seeing somebody on their hands and knees and they were praying and asking God for forgiveness. For the Apostle Paul, it was Jesus literally blinding him with the glory of God and knocking him down on the way to Damascus while he's trying to arrest Christians to have them killed. When God's after you, he's after you, and he wants to change his life, your life, he's going to change it to somebody. But this message is for ordinary people today. Because these people were ordinary people in the beginning. And they became extraordinary because of the life-changing experience of salvation. And God wants to do that in our lives. We go back to the Bible. We find this other individual called 
the Apostle John. We know him as the one who, who, who wrote about God and love. God is love. God is love. But did you know that Jesus, when he first met him, and when, when John and his brother James was walking with them, John had a big mouth, and he was always ready to go ahead and, you know, just bring and call down fire from heaven on any town that did not believe in Jesus. Let's look into the scriptures. Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent his messages on ahead, who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples John, James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? That's pretty, pretty radical. But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. So these incidences of how John... You know, we find in the book of, um, in, in all of his epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, he's, God is love. Everyone that loves is born of God. We see him, oh, he's the gentle one. He's the gentle John, gentle John. Not in the beginning he wasn't. He was like the Apostle Paul in some respects. He needed a change in his life. He was like George Mueller who needed salvation. And John was heavily influenced by the personality of, and the love of Jesus, because John is the one who laid his bosom at the Last Supper. I, he laid his head on Jesus' bosom. In other words, he got close to him. He was sitting right next to him. He learned from Jesus. And Jesus' presence and his mannerisms and the way Jesus talked and the way Jesus acted changed him. But until then, Jesus changed his name. In Mark chapter 3, verse 17, James, the son of uh, Zebedee and his brother John, to them he gave the a name Bonerges, which means sons of thunder. They were always shaking things up. But then, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, years later, and John probably wrote these epistles maybe 20, 25 years after Jesus had risen from the dead. He said, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The power of a changed, saved life is tremendous. You have been saved. You have the Holy Spirit within you, and in all of your problems, in all of your situations, God's still going to use you to be able to go ahead and uplift somebody. And you young people sitting here right now, you might not even be on fire for God you, God hasn't gripped your heart yet, but you, you could be like George Mueller. As a boy, he wanted nothing to do with the things of God. He ended up giving his life and all of his money and his fortunes to being able to help children, especially orphans, because he could grab a hold of a scripture and find out that God is a father to the orphan, and he would grab onto it. And I, didn't t I talk about the rest of George Mueller's life. He became a man of intense prayer. He prayed every single day. He prayed more and more and more, especially working with orphans at that particular time. He didn't have a lot of money. He prayed the money in every day. And he determined for the rest of his life he would read the New Testament through four times every year. The power of a changed and saved life to affect others. The last individual we're going to talk about is John Newton. Now, most of you know who John Newton was, but he was, he was an Anglican clergyman, a former slave ship master. And it, even after he began to be drawn towards Christianity, slavery was still legal. Kind of like abortion today, it's still legal. And a lot of people would accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and still, well, I don't have a problem with abortion. A woman's got a right to kill her offspring. You see, John Newton was kind of like that because he was still having to work through these things. But it got to a place in his life, even after he left the slave trade, as God began to work in his life when he did accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, that he began to see the horrors of it. You see, before we come to Christ, we're blinded by sin. We really, when you look back, if you're a Christian now, you look back at some of the things you did and say, how could I do these things? 
The Bible says that Satan blinds the minds of the unbelieving that they don't come to the light of the gospel. So it was the same with John Newton. By the way, if you don't know who John Newton was, he, he uh, collaborated with another man, William Cowper, to produce a volume of hymns. One of the greatest was Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Well, John Newton decided that he was going to live for Jesus Christ, and he starts a church. And John Newton, it took him a while to get over this idea that slavery was legal and, you know, why even try to upset the apple cart? But it worked on him to the place where he began to join with others and say slavery is a horrendous, horrendous sin against God. And everywhere he wrote about it. He wrote and shared how he treated horrendously slaves on his slave ship. He wrote about the horrors of it so much that it horrified even England itself when they heard what was going on in these slave ships. And then another man by the name of William, um, William Wilberforce. You might not have known him, but in England, he was a very, very stately individual, a lot of influence in society. But he started going to the church, and he was heavily influenced by John Newton speaking about the horrors of slavery. So much that after Wilberforce, who already knew Jesus, just picked up this and went with it. And then Wilberforce was going to, he said, you know what, I'm going to leave the government. I want to be a missionary. I just want to, I want to be like you. Newton said, don't leave. Stay. Be a changer. And Wilberforce worked for the next 15 to 20 years to be able to constantly, constantly introduce bills to be able to stop slavery. And a few days before he died, finally England passed a ban on slavery. It's just amazing, the life-changing power of a saved life. John Newton who was a tremendous, tremendous, horrific sinner, ends up being the instrument of God to be able to influence this man by Wilberforce to be able to go ahead and end slavery in England. The life-changing power of a saved life. How many people are saved listening to this message right now? Well, there's a life-changing power within inside of you, and I want to encourage you because you're wondering, well, what do I do? I mean, how, how do I develop this? You don't develop anything. You just live your life now. You once were lost in sin, but Jesus took you in. There was a light that flooded your soul, and now you walk. Just as Vinnie shared, it's a, it's a process that takes place in your life. You let a little of the light of the gospel into your heart. It begins to work on you. Then you start to read about Jesus. and You fellowship with other Christians. And your life is dramatically changed. Like George Mueller. He just did a prayer meeting. He sees somebody on his hands and knees asking for forgiveness. It convicts his heart of his need. He goes home and he prays. And then he opens up 117 schools. And he ends up educating uh, 120,000 children. Most of them orphans in the word of God and also giving them a regular education so that they could pro be producers in society. That is the life-changing power of a saved life. I close with this scripture in Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. And it's really, it's really what it's all about down here is we as Christians to be witnesses for Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples when he sent them out. He said, as you go preach this message, the kingdom of God, uh, heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Would you stand to your feet with me? I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward and the singers. And we'll worship the Lord in a song. And for those that are here right now saying, wow, what's God going to do with my life? Well, just let God unfold your life. Because everyone that you come in contact with, everyone you come in contact with, if God's got a hold of your life, something is going to speak through you to be able to shed the light of the gospel. How is the kingdom of God expanded in the earth? Wherever 
anyone is subjected to the kingdom of God, there is Jesus Christ right here on this earth. The kingdom of God does not come with observation, Jesus said, for the kingdom of God is within you. And if there's anyone here right now that would like to make sure of your salvation, to make sure that, that if you were to die tonight, then you stood in the presence of God, that God would receive you because you believe that Jesus Christ saved you from your sins, not on basis on your works, because all of us here have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's in Romans. But the remedy for sin is to believe that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. If we believe that, the Bible says that we are saved. We become a saved life. And what is a saved life? The Holy Spirit comes in and makes our spirit alive again. And as Vinny was sharing, all of a sudden, he could understand the things of the Bible more. Like George Mueller could understand what his call was upon his life. And we can understand what God wants us to do down here on this earth. Because there's a purpose for us on this earth. It might not be to be able to stand in a pulpit like me. I never dreamed I'd ever be here. And for those who know me all these years, I'm not far from, I'm, I'm far from perfect. Not, that's, well, amen. You know what I mean by that. Praise God. But God is good. God changes us. I want to give everyone here an opportunity to be able to make sure of your salvation right now. Would you bow your hearts and minds and those listening to this message? If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, want to be sure of your salvation and be sure that you're saved, there's a simple prayer you can pray. And for those that want to rededicate their lives over to Jesus Christ, you can pray this prayer too as an act of consecration. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me from all my sins. I believe, Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, you rose from the dead. Save my soul. Grant me eternal life, O Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might be a good witness for you with my life. Jesus, I ask you to lead me, to guide me into all truth. And I thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen.